the aunt had another special needs child she had experience right. she was well established had a home she worked for the police department in new jersey and they felt that that was going to be a better placement the judge for the reasons that i mentioned uh, agreed with the parents and actually went against the uh, the assessed decision and the sjc during their decision stated that there was a uh, no discretion abused by the judge with the best interest of the child served by adopted by the aunt rather than the mom. Um, and it was ruled in that case that the judge may rule on a different plan than one provided by DSS right. based on the best interest test. What did the SJC say about what their standard of review should be? Or should it be? It you mentioned be, it, it actually be, at the beginning. It should be based on the best opportunities for the child fact that they, under, they understood the trauma of the placement and separation, but the best interest of the child outweighed the fact that okay, they've been living with the that was the trial judge's decision below, but how should the SJC be reviewing decisions like this? Best interest test. Well, the best interest test is a legal standard. Think a bit more as what, as a, what is an appellate court now it's doing that has reviewed that decision child with the paternal aunt because it's supposedly the child's best interest, in, in what way does the SJC or, or appeals court for that matter, because it's an appeals court as well, um, in, in what way does, what standard of review does the appellate court use? You guys all know what I mean when Gen I say standard. First, let's just define what the standard of review is on. That's, it's the way that um, the court decides the test, whether like the burden of proof start is on the plaintiff or. Well, no. that's, it, it's funny that you brought that up because there are, hold on. Do we want her to come? Sure. Yeah. Is that the out. standard review what yeah. the appeals court uses yeah. to evaluate the, the lower court's decision? Okay, I heard three different things and let's, 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 I'll summarize each of them. I've heard best interest, which is a legal standard courts use when children are involved. I've heard burden of proof, right, which is a, 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 a what is proved by a petitioner, right, at a trial or at hearings. And then standard of review is what I was asking about. Right. Isn't the standard review that that's the, the test, so to speak, what the appeals court uses to review a lower court's decision. Yes, yes. And Leslie, okay. did you want to add to that? Yes, uh, uh, there's deference to the appeal court. Okay, so that's an example. deference to so, the uh, lower court unless there's a finding of judicial misconduct or ju judicial indiscretion. As long as a, So you're, now Leslie's talking about a type of standard of right. review that's normally called discretion, right? And appellate courts will not disturb trial courts' decisions normally absent findings of abuse of discretion or error of law. Uh, or error of law. Error of law or abuse of discretion. Okay. And notice what the SJC also said. We do not sit as a trial court to review de novo the evidence presented by the parties. Now, de novo is another form of review not as popular as abuse of discretion or trial court error. Usually when appellate courts are reviewing cases, they're reviewing um, in terms of what did the trial court do below, right? And if what it did was an error of law or an abuse of its discretion, the case is gonna go back down for whatever, you know, remanded for a new trial or reversed or affirmed if everything's hunky-dory. So that's what I was alluding to. So those, again, the best interest is nothing more than a legal standard, right, that has been articulated now both by statute, 210, and case law. Um, so you guys that are gonna be taking the bar whenever you see a family law question that deals with children, don't forget to throw in the term best interest in there. <laughs> You'll at least get a point or two <laughs> for getting the best interest test in there. There's always gonna be something about best interest if you're talking, whether it's a divorce case, a, modica a divorce modification, uh, um, a neglect and abuse case, a termination case, 
best interest is always going to be an issue uh, if it's a legal standard. And then back to when John said earlier, standard of proof, that's when you go to some trial or some hearing, and the burden of proof is usually on the party that you know brings the case. So when we, we talked about the 72-hour hearings, the burden of proof is on the DCF because the DCF is the petitioner, and uh, they have to show by preponderance that you know return of the children would result in you know, the children being neglect. When the case goes to trial, of course, it's clear and convincing evidence again. So those are burdens. What else can we say, uh, Richard, about the Hugo case? Did you say it all? Why is it, and I think you quoted the court, a heart-wrenching decision? Why was this a heart-wrenching decision? The, court, the court's biggest, well, the judge's biggest problem with the case was that he clearly saw that the child wanted to be with the foster mother, the foster mother cared, but again, when he looked at all the factors and what that child was going to need, he applied the best interest test to say the best placement for him and his decision was going to be with the aunt. Now, Patricia, you said before when you were reading the cases, was this one of the cases when that what did you say earlier? That when yeah, you read the cases you thought that the court would go otherwise. I thought I thought for the educational purposes and the, um, what the aunt could do in that one was okay. It was later on, okay. I think closer to the end. Why is it hot? This is a case, uh, I've thought a lot about this case uh, just over the last 10 years, knowing couples in the situation. Uh, two women who have a baby by in vitro. And after, I think it was eight years, the birth, the birthing woman, they're, they're both the mother of the child, but the birthing partner uh, claimed that she want, oh, they, they, the, the, the two women were going to separate mm -hmm. after moving a couple of times, finally to Massachusetts. By the way, as opposed to the rest of the cases that we've read, pretty much thus far, you know, uh, care and custody of petition of the uh, DCF to adopt. Notice this is Eno versus LLM. So what kind of a case it, was it's this? It's the, uh, the non-birthing partner You can just say if you want the de, de, de facto parent because you're going to talk about Oh, they're the the de facto or, or, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, they're both de facto parents, but uh, the de facto parent wants, now is it visitation only or? Well, that's what I was going to ask you again. What kind of a case, who, you know, who, 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 who's the, who, the moving party, the petitioner, the uh, person filing a complaint? What kind of complaint was it? I, the, the, I read this case a, a while back, but it was, uh, oh, it was a joint custody case. 
Am I right about that? <laughs> Somebody help me. I thought they, the parent, the de facto parent wanted the uh, the partner wanted. She moved out. They they were together as parents for what was it, eight or nine years? Okay, and then Lex is okay with the facts. Right. I'm just asking what kind of procedurally, who sued who in what court? The what de facto parent sued the the birth mother for. filing a divorce complaint, we, you didn't have DCF, so how do you get something like that rolling? Remember, at back at that point, in that time period, too, this was, you know, new. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, the judge held that it didn't matter that they were not married, that even heterosexual couples. Okay, but you said the judge, so what court were they in and how? That's uh, what I'm the asking. Pro, the probate okay. court. Okay, and how? Uh, probate courts have jurisdiction of? In custody. It actually was an equity. Oh, yes, you it was. You guys have heard that term before, right? Oh. Equity. Yeah. Yeah. Has equity. In fact, juvenile court as well has equity jurisdiction. They didn't know what to do, or else it was the Yeah. To, just to get herself in there to get heard, right? The, the, the. Go ahead, you can continue now. Yeah, it's just that the, the. I guess it was the probate court yeah. rule held yeah. mm -hmm. that there was subject matter jurisdiction, mm -hmm. there was uh, personal jurisdiction, and there was equity jurisdiction. Mm -hmm to hear this case. Mm -hmm. And th going backwards, the, the judge held that it was a best interest uh, standard in determining if the moving party could have visitation rights. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was a joint custody no. issue there. No, it was just visitation. So this is the, the leading case Well, in this case, the moving party, the de facto parent, is sort of, she, she attended all the, the decision making mm -hmm. in the in vitro process. She was there in the birthing center. Uh, she actually supported the entire family. Uh, she was an what, e equal partner. What, what else can we list if we're going to do bullet list of what a de facto parent is? What else can you add to what uh, Leslie just said? And the child called her either mommy or mama. I got those two confused. Called her something like that. What else is a de facto parent? Yes. Um, he's more like a substitute, um, um, caretaker. A, 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 a caretaker. Yeah. Okay. No, not a bio mom or a bio dad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no biological connection. What else? Yes, yes, Professor. Um, was it, 
I, the, the not de facto parents, A? Or was it a donor egg and sperm? I don't remember. Is it written I thought in it was your just case? case? I thought it was just um, information. I yeah, that, that information. Just, what did you say? I thought sure. it was just artificial insemination. That's what I thought. I thought it was oh, her, the other her biological factor. egg. And she was just artificially inseminated. So it, it was her egg. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought too. There was going to be expert testimony right. uh, to lend credence to the probability that there was either an intentional harm or neglectful harm right. yeah. or to whether, Iris. Or whether they knew or should have known you know, that she had been seriously injured before they took her to the hospital. And so what is this double jeopardy? Why not? And that's the key right there. How would it, 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 it if, if there was a, if they were defendants in another context, correct? There might be a double jeopardy issue. Like a trial. criminal case. What's that? In a criminal case, mm -hmm. you know, you would have that, you would have that situation. But because 
investigator um, reports to the judge that they shouldn't come in because they're in the parent protection, parent protection proceeding. Uh, they're arguing against the submission of written reports from a court appointed investigator. Um, what does that SJC mean when it said that she continues to be, quote, to deny all responsibility for those submissions? And it would be everything that you just listed. Yes. That she, she, quote, she continues to deny all responsibility for those submissions. What does that mean? I mean, by like saying that it's not her fault, that it's a battered woman syndrome, and just kind of blaming the department for giving adequate consideration and not helping her do the right thing. Is that the question you're asking? What would it consist of? I would have to say maybe <clears throat> it's like if you if you have responsibility for these issues, it means that you're com you're complying with the some sort of you're going to therapy or you're. But what if she was? You know, you guys all read about the bad women syndrome, and, and maybe you know a little bit more about it in other classes or whatnot. Um, what if she indeed was suffering from bad women syndrome and that she did indeed then make a lot of those issues? Um, what would that mean in terms of the court translating her behavior into, oh, she's denying it? I think I think you're saying is that that situation to be absent so she uh, it erases her conduct or it takes away her responsibility. She's and then in other words, she's trying to use the battered women syndrome as an excuse. Well, in this case, to that's say, what the court may be saying. But I was playing devil's advocate and, and arguing the opposite. And what I was saying is that you know, the battered women syndrome is, is the constellation of behaviors that make you look. Uh, honestly, you know, not so good in the legal environment. Um, it, seems like, it seems like in this case that the court focused on the fact not only that she couldn't understand or couldn't acknowledge what had happened previously, but she was about to jump into another relationship with Gerald, which was the same as the relationship with Robert. Yeah. yeah. Also, she got kicked out of the drug rehab treatment program, so not only did she, she look bad, mistake. did she Regardless of whether she was battered or not, it seemed like her ability to care for the children. Well, I like that. Say that again, Jim. Just regardless of whether she suffered from battered woman syndrome or not, right. her ability currently to care for the children was questionable at best. Her partner obviously wasn't going to be good either with his allegations of those abuse. And remember that, I, to take it a step further, this was also an adoption case. So the court had to consider even more. some or all of those 14 factors that we looked at the other day, Patricia? Well, well Sandra had mentioned before about um, doing enough to help the parents get there. And I had a note written that was, it, was enough done to really help this mother get where she needs to be. Good point. To put her in a good position for being able to care for the children. Good point, good point. Um, did she truly have all of these issues that she's saying that she does? from the time of the filing of the petition up until the trial, she may not have had enough time to get her act together. Or the resources. Right, right, yeah. So do the courts take into consideration that uh, we have battered women, you know, in, in front of the court, um, she looks miserable and uh, looks like the batter is always in control. So you have more experience No one condition in and of itself is going to also be, is going to be enough to terminate parental rights or maybe even to seize custody. But it, it, and Tim just said it's how it's how that condition affects the you know your 
ability to parent the child. They know that the cases could be upset on, on appeal if they made some error or abuse their discretion. So they're very um, cognizant of the fact that they have to take every fact and pick it up high and outline it and number it so that it will amount to unfitness. Are, are, the, are the cases that are used all the time, I mean, it's the case law part, mm -hmm. what is unfitness in the state of Massachusetts? or? Are, are the cases that you would cite? Do you think so? I'm sure there are, but I'm just wondering if. Not really. No. Depends on the no. case. Yeah, and it depends on the case factually. Um, 210 gives us a little bit of leeway now where there's some statutory, statutory language in 210 about, about, about fitness. Um, what to remember most about it is, is that it, it's connected with best interest. SJC has said in earlier language when we had the in, in, it was the Department of Public Welfare at the time that the um, unfitness test and best interest test are not separate and distinct they're cognitive and connected so you know when you're discussing these issues or you're presented with a panel of, um, it's very hard to take it apart and talk about you know the, uh, a parent's mental
teacher. See? I, I like a, and who helps him with raising her exactly. homework. Could do it himself. Because then the argument was, you don't even have a, a, a third grade level education. How are you going to teach your kid? And so she right. came to court and said, well, I'll help. him but it's really because um, him and his sister Roberta um, living with their mother who had well technically it's Manuel's father but not Roberta's father so the, the sister had a different father okay um, the father wasn't living in the home however um, DCSS the department um, filed a petition for a care protection mm -hmm. because of abuses towards Roberta not Manuel um, and so anyway, um, it went forward, and um, who was Manuel, Manuel placed with at birth? Oh, he was placed, well, they wanted custody of both Manuel and Roberta, R Roberta, um, who but they were placed in temporary placements in foster care. They were? Department? Yeah, the department awarded legal custody of both children on, a, you know, on an emergency basis.
arguing for a second time around. I want a, I, you know, I want a hearing. I didn't have a hearing the first time because I was okay, you know, with going with Mrs. B. You know, now there was an issue there. There was a Q and A or whatever it was that, that they pulled me out of that home. Um, now I have a right. I have a right to seventy-two hours and the same as Karen said, the seventy-two hours. Um, and I wanted also so that I could ask for. on when we talked about cases that set the standard when we did uh, Santosky versus Kramer and Robin and all of that. I think it was in that pack and then I included it here as part of the adoption cases and I don't remember why I included it in this section. But we did do it before. Okay, who wants to do the Helen case? So wait, so the highlight is, so the main thing for this case is so if you waive your right the first time, then you pretty much and section 25, as I mentioned before, are, are the same in terms of the issue before the court. Should we be giving legal custody to DCF, right? Should we be taking custody away from a parent? Um, the only difference is 24 occurs after an emergency removal. 25 is n occurs, but not after an emergency removal. But Whenever that's an issue before the court, the parties, meaning the children and the parents, have a right to a hearing. Just because he waived, it, it still was care and protection of Manuel. I mean, the case didn't end, right? So that was that, that was you know the argument that was made that that was made initially. Oh, you know, you waived before. Yeah, but I waived before when you know you first took me out of my home. And I was fine with DCF custody and placement with, with Mrs. B. Okay. But now it's DCF custody, and I want to be able to go with Mrs. B. Yeah. 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 Did, the, did the case hinge on the fact that in the first hearing, custody wasn't awarded? They, they did a hearing, but custody wasn't awarded? No, he waived. There was no 72 hour hearing. He waived his right. About that, and that's done a lot. Parties will waive for whatever reason. You know, even parents will because uh, you know they know that they, for example, they know they're going to lose at a 72-hour hearing, and the court's going to hear all this damaging information. You know, so go with it. Let DCF have custody temporarily. Let's see what we can do to get our act together and to comply with services. And you know, we'll hopefully get our children back. But that's you not know. what's said when you waive that 72-hour hearing. It's gonna look bad either way, let's put it. <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> you know. There's uh, an inference that you're not even trying at that point. Well, the court isn't, the issue isn't unfitness, so the courts can make that inference later at trial if you don't get involved and testify. But, um, so that's what it was. And then now called me in well hearings when parties, children, parents, want to be able at the 72 hour hearing to not only you know be there and advocate um, for or against custody, but also to advocate a particular placement as well. All right, adoption of Helen. It is.
CSS and the joint venture, the, the temporary venture with the um, department, with the Bobby Brown Theater. This um, went all the way to termination, no? She started again to um,
birthday too. children and the SJC took the case from the appeals court and the, they're answering the three questions. Um, was the deci decision to terminate parental rights by clear and convincing evidence? Uh, was the investigator's report um, admissible? Mm -hmm. And um, if the judge erred by not granting post-adoption uh, visitation rights. So. Um, the court say about the investigators? The court said that care and protection proceedings are interrelated to, in this case, were interrelated to the proceeding to dispense with parental right. consent. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was admissible. They found that it was, they upheld the judge's decision in the lower court that it was admissible. Um, what had happened was um, the mother the mother was living, um, Mary and Michael were by different uh, fathers, um, neither of whom was the mother's current boyfriend, and he um, had been, uh, Mary and Michael both reported that he was sexually abusing them, and apparently, it's a little, what it seems like happened is that on the, apparently on the time she was, when she was reporting it to the mother, on that day, the father was charged with assault and battery against both children. Okay. So he's incarcerated, and um, um, the court, you know, just pointed out um, that the mother is still visiting him in prison, um, and that oh, th well, actually, I think the big issue was that the children are, have been in foster care for a while. This mm -hmm. was back in. 1993, mm -hmm. but Mary had been in foster care for two years, mm -hmm. and and they were doing okay in foster care. The court pointed out that um, that they um, that the people taking care of them were aware that they that they had um, some issues, but that they that they were able to work with them and aware of the issues. On what ev evidence did the court support the finding of the unfit Um. The, they really seem to just say the fact that um, that this w that this was allowed to happen within the house was I didn't s really see anything else besides they also talk about the fact that the mother has prior convictions um, it's, I don't know if I'm missing anything And, and the fact that she won't, that, that she's, she still seems to be this, um, maintaining a relationship with the current boyfriend. Okay. All right. Dr. Diane? Admitted they were he was listening to testimony that had been made that that uh, should have been excluded uh, under social worker client privilege. Um, but the exception provides that social workers may disclose it um, to initiate a proceeding under section three of chapter the 210. Um, but right, the mother right. argues about the exception, etc. Um, and the allowance to of uh, the in drastic intervention in family life. So the ne information there is necessary. It's a severe intrusion, but they have to do it um, because of the significant consequences. Uh, but the mother argues that the exception should not apply when social workers' initial involvement was unrelated to care and protection procedures, proceedings or proceedings in connection with the petition to dispense with consent to adopt. So, uh, I'm sorry, are you saying that she was saying that uh, there was a connection with the social worker 
before the right there was an excited it, yeah there was an exception that our, um, she, the social worker's initial involvement was unrelated to the care and protection so she didn't know why she'd be involved in the care and safety so what does this case mean for for care and protection and termination law uh, that was one of the ones that i had why was this action this why was the, this action taken on this particular case um We're talking about a privilege, right? For parenting? No, social worker privilege. Oh, the social worker privilege, yeah, that, that uh, well, there is is none if it means it the does, safety it of the It doesn't kids. apply, you're saying, in right. contempt proceedings. Right. And the reason why is? Because of the uh, safety of the uh, children, the significant best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an exception to right. what normally is a privilege that's precisely why the safety of the child, um, the social worker is able to disclose to the court as a witness. There's an exception to the privilege, and that's all this is. The mother also brought up that uh, she tried to get the conversations between the psychiatrist and the child thrown out, mm -hmm. and the court said, you don't have any standing, only if the child objects to those statements coming in. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the mother didn't want the conversation because it was gonna be negative towards her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 1985, the dates in this case kind of overlap, it's a little confusing at first. Okay. But you got a three-year-old uh, granted, or temporary custody of a three-year-old is given to the Department of Social Services. He's uh, placed in a foster home with his older brother. Uh, a year after that, April of 86, Boston Juvenile Court adjudicated the boy in the care and protection and permanently committed to the facility, DSS. So it went from a temporary custody to a permanent custody. Um, but, however, they issued that order, but they didn't actually come out with their findings for another year. When you say they, which court do you The mean? juvenile court. Yeah, and remember, I'm glad you said the year, because so this was the time when you had both both juvenile court care protection cases and probate court contempt cases. Yeah. Okay. So, 85 temporary custody, April of 86, permanent custody, but the findings weren't released until April of 87, so almost literally 365 days later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, it's kind of interesting, for some reason the mother did not appeal. Um, I don't know if it's because she didn't have the findings, so she didn't know what the case was going on, okay. whatever it was, mm -hmm. she didn't appeal. Uh, however, she appeared to get a new attorney, um, and they filed a motion uh, basically asked for permission to file a late appeal, mm -hmm. it was denied. Uh, they didn't give her a hearing on it, but it was denied. Um, and, okay. That went up to a single justice, and again, no appeal was taken from the denial. But now, 1986, so we're back after April permanent custody, but before the findings were released, um, the Boston, the BSEA, the Boston Children's Services uh, filed a 210 mm -hmm. to dispense with the parental consent to the child's adoption. Uh, the mother objects, uh, and then it's a five-day hearing, uh, and the probate judge on January 8, 1988, uh, found that the biological parents were unfit to assume parental responsibilities, and that the DCSA's plan for adoption was the best interest of the child. Uh, the probate judge also found that visitation between the mother and the child was harmful to the child and thus terminated the visit. This time, the right. mother actually did file an appeal on time, mm -hmm. um, motion with, and along with a motion to allow continuing visitation pending the appeal. The motions were denied. And so then she appealed. Um, and she appealed based on, I think it's five issues. Um, yeah, five issues. That the probate judge erred in excluding certain evidence which addressed facts already determined in the care and protection case, and that the probate judge improperly relied upon the deterioration of family relationship caused by Kimberly's separation, that the probate judge's findings failed to demonstrate consideration of the contribution of the mother's boyfriend to the family, and that the probate judge improperly relied upon certain expert testimony, and that certain findings of fact are unsupported by the evidence. So the case is transferred to the appeals court, um, and they end up affirming. And it was kind of interesting 
I don't have the transcripts, but it appears from what the court's talking about that the first appeal, they used, they must have used collateral estoppel, which they didn't allow her to argue facts from before. And she did bring up these interesting arguments that the court's talked about, which is, does Karen protection, these cases are all about the parent's ability to parent at that time. Current. Current. Then, then, then the collateral estoppel shouldn't apply because you're, you're, you're now talking about those issues again, but at a different time. Mm -hmm. So they agreed with her on that, but didn't find the evidence, you know, so they agreed that, yeah, collateral estoppel shouldn't apply, but however, if we take out collateral estoppel, we still agree with what the, the judge is finding. So in the end, she did not get a fair trial. Uh, so he had a good argument, but. Oh, but no, you didn't have the lengthy separation between the parent and child. And you had the, 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 the bond between the and child. And that was brought up a lot by the kid. Mm -hmm. When she goes to visit her, her child, there's a lot of talk in here that the child is, does not like him. Right. Um, and a lot of quote unquote experts, social workers and all that testified that this is not good for the child. Um, child does not like it when he knows his mom's coming for a visit. Can't wait till the visit to be done. Is all anxious when the foster mother's not there to specify time. So I think it appears that the appeals court really kind of focused on that as their basis of what's in the best interest of the kid, not the mom. And remember the SJC also said something about that they're, they're all factors yeah. to be weighed by the judge with no one factor being determinative. Yeah. Yeah. This, the, this was another case though that when I looked at it, I, I had another note. Why, you know, all those issues were happening, but why weren't they putting interventions in place? For right. visitation, why weren't they doing modeling at a, at a visitation until they felt that the mother could do it you successfully? Mean, supervised, I'm sorry. Right, supervised, but, yeah. but yeah. not just supervised, but a model. So somebody's showing what you should do because obviously the parent didn't have those skills. So it just seemed like in, in a few of these cases, like and they're now always- they, For example, now they do parenting classes. So right. And in probate court as well, if you want that route. Well, well, it just seemed yeah. like so, some of them, they were kind of like hung out to dry because they didn't have the skills to begin with and they really didn't get the, service. the services to help them get there for even shot. Still might not have worked, but at least right. if they were in place, you'd feel that it was a more equitable yeah. situation for everybody. Um,